Father, you've been so good to me over the years. Lord, I know there's a villain inside me. Lord, I know if you hadn't taken hold of my life, I'd probably be a millionaire or doing some time in jail. And Lord, you've been so gracious to me. Lord, I know what I am. And it's all the grace of God, Lord. It's so free. And Lord, you can take the weak things of the world to compound the mighty. And I acknowledge, Lord, I'm one of the weak things. No great intellect, no great business acumen, no great talent, Lord. Lord, I'm so grateful that you, you choose men. And speak the unsearchable riches of God, Lord, through mouths that would never glorify you in the flesh. Lord, I feel so thankful, so grateful, so blessed. And Lord, to be able to stand and talk to people, Lord, about you and, and help people to get a, a, an understanding of the real God, Lord, it, it's so, so refreshing to me. I just pray, Lord, that this last session of today will carry your spirit, that you'll quicken our minds. Help us, Father. You're such a good God. We appreciate you. Amen. We've talked about Jesus coming again and restoring Israel. Although I missed a lot of that study out, but that was part of it. You'll have to read the chapter in the book. But I can't really talk about the restoration of Israel, the 12 tribes, without talking about Esau. Now, I've kept dropping hints because, you know, what's Esau got to do with the restoration of Israel? So I understand it may be new to you. But Jacob and Esau were twins, weren't they? Who became the enemies. It's not by chance they were of the same seed. Isaac was the father, wasn't he? Isaac had Jacob and Esau. Isaac loved Esau, not Jacob. It's strange when you, you think about it. Jacob loved Esau and Rebekah loved Jacob, who was a twister. His name means supplanter, twister. That's what Jacob means, and boy, was it his character. Met his match with Uncle Laban. He, he would have had to screw him into the coffin. He was so twisted, wasn't he, Laban? But and Jacob met his match. Jacob twisted his brother out of the birthright. He was a twister by name. Re you know why Rebecca loved Jacob, don't you? Because she was like him. She was a cunning twister, read Genesis 27. She set him up to it. Go and tell lies to your father. Go and kill a thing and I'll put it on you. She put Jacob up to it. She loved Jacob because he was like her. She was a deceiver. And she put Jacob up to it. Is that right? I'm supposing you know the story. Go and get the pottage and let's pretend that you're Esau. And she helped her son. But Isaac loved Esau. But despite that, I'm not preaching predestination as a doctrine, but God predetermined before they were born. I suppose we should read it. Let's, let's read it. Very interesting, he saw in Jacob. Uh, Genesis 25. You see, I used to, and so if you have thought this up to now, that's great, because I used to. I used to think it was Ishmael and Isaac that was the problem. But actually, Ishmael's from the good seed, not the bad seed. Ishmael comes from Abraham, the good seed, is that right? It's just, from the good seed comes the flesh and the spirit. He was the son of the flesh, not the child of the promise, but Ishmael was the good seed. And God blessed him and said, I'll make great nations of you. God blessed the lad. And when he was dying in the wilderness, God came, didn't let him die, and heard his cry and gave him water and said, I'll make great nations out of you. Ishmael's from the good seed, but the flesh. You walk in the flesh. You're not from the bad seed. You've got Christ in you. There's always the flesh and the spirit walk together. That's Ishmael and Isaac. Esau's different. Genesis 25, verse 20. Isaac was 40 years old. He took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padanaim. You know the story, don't you? 
And Isaac entreated the Lord because she was barren. All this is significant, she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebecca, his wife, conceived. So Rebecca didn't entreat the Lord because she was barren. Isaac entreated God for his barren wife, okay. It's not the wife, it was Isaac he entreated the Lord. And God heard him and opened a womb. And his wife conceived. And the children struggled together within her. So she's having twins. Ishmael and Isaac were brothers, but they weren't of the same seed, meaning the same conception. Do you understand? Esau and uh, Jacob were the one seed. It was one conception that produced twins, which is different than two brothers from the same man. So Ishmael and Isaac were from Abram's seed, but they weren't from the one conception. One conception brought two. Do you understand? Cain and Abel were twins, I believe, from the one seed, the one conception. If you read carefully, it says, Eve bore Cain and also bare his brother. In the Bible it says, they conceived and bore a child, they conceived and bore the child. It seems as though it's both from the same conception, read it. It would fit perfectly with the two, the good seed and the bad seed, coming from the one conception. There's a difference. The sperm, you know, making two seeds out of the one conception. I'm not going into it, it's very, very significant. There's another set of twins, isn't there? Pharaohs and Terah. There's, there's sets of twins in the Bible. Very significant, because they've come from one conception. All right, I won't go into that, but just log it in your brain. Whenever you come across twins, it's the one conception producing two seeds, not two brothers from the same father. If it's not significant, put it on the back burner. And uh, in the, the womb, the children struggled together within her, and she said, if it be so, why am I thus? W what's happening? In those days, they didn't have scans after three months, so she wouldn't know they were twins, would they? She's got struggles in her womb. And she went to a cry of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your room. Two nations from one conception. Ishmael was from another conception to produce another nation. But two nations from one conception. And they'll be separated from your bowels. Sorry, and two manner of people. Why say that? Two manner of people will be separated from your bowels. As soon as they come out, they're separate. They're not going to start to be different. They're different in the womb. There's two, pe two nations in your womb. Not the become nations, the nations are in your womb. This is predetermined of God. This is not because Isaac made a bad choice and Jacob made a good one. Actually, Jacob was the twister and Isaac was the firstborn and should have had the inheritance. Esau, sorry. Shouldn't Esau have had the inheritance? Wasn't it the firstborn? Isn't that God's law? The firstborn gets the inheritance and the double blessing. But God determined it was going to be different. Isn't it funny how God changes his own laws? God makes the laws for us, not for him. The man who makes the law is above the law. Don't tell God to keep his own law. That's why he's God. Do you understand? He makes the laws for us because we're not God. So we need laws. God doesn't need laws. Okay. So God says the firstborn gets the inheritance, but many times the hands cross over. And Joseph said, Father, you've got it all wrong. He says, I haven't, my son. I know what I'm doing. It happened twice, didn't it? Ephraim and Manasseh. And Funny how God, that wasn't the devil slipping in to change it. That wasn't human nature. God reversed what he told us to do and did something different because he's God, you see. He just lets you know he's God, don't put him in the box. That's what the church does, they put him in the box, the doctrines are fixed. Well, doctrines are fixed, but God's not a doctrine, he's a person. Persons have emotions and get anger and that. Two nations are in your womb, two manner of people shall be separated from your bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. That's contrary to God's law. It's not right that the elders serve the young. God says, I'm determined. This is my plan. Get out of it. 
See, we do our plans and you have to obey the laws of God. But God had his own plan and said, look, it's nothing to do with you, Rebecca. I put two nations in you womb, you didn't. You made love to your husband. But I put two nations in you and they're going to be two separate people and I'm going to reverse the order. The elder will serve the younger. And the one that shouldn't get the blessing will get it all. That's strange, isn't it? See, when God does it, it's not your way. Your ways are not God's way and God's ways are not your ways. So do it according to God's law. But when God does it, don't tell God he was wrong. Okay. It's a principle. Challenge me if I do it wrong, but when God does it, all you've got to determine, is this God or not? If it's me, tell me off. You've not obeyed the law of God. You're right. See, God told Abram to go and kill his son. If he'd gone to the Sanhedrin, they would have said, Abram, you've, it's the devil, that. No way would God tell you to kill your son. Put yourself in the shoes. If Isaiah said to you, God's told me to walk naked through the streets and then say, that's what God will do to Israel, strip you naked. You say, Isaiah, just preach it, but you don't have to do that, walk around in your underpants. I'm, not, I'm sure he wasn't stark naked. When he said he was naked, I'm sure he walked around in his undergarments, aren't you? Maybe it was completely naked, but I think nakedness to them was to, you know, like David, he stripped off his garments and danced. But he could have been stark naked, I'm giving you the benefit, it was in his underclothes, but in case you think it wasn't naked. But it was still a terrible shame. And then say that, if Isaiah came to me, I'd say, Isaiah, that's an abomination. You don't walk naked. That's not God, that's the devil. That's your own ego. And so many times God told people to do things, and you as a Christian, knowing God's rules, would stop them. That's why God's got to push people out to start revival, because the church can't allow it. The Catholic Church could never have a revival. They had to push Martin Luther out. They had to push General Booth out. Don't get out yourself and think you're elite. Be careful. If it's God, that's all right. If it's not God, you're a rebel. Do you understand? Don't play at God. If you want to pick a deacon... There are clear rules, husband and one wife. God tells you, you're not God, so if you want to pick a deacon in your church, that's the criteria. If they don't fit it, they're disqualified. For me, women are disqualified. It said the husband of one wife. It doesn't say, oh, the wife of one husband. Read it. It can only apply to men. A man's got to be in charge of his own household to leave the church. Well, a woman can't be the head of the house to do it. He said, if you can't have your wife and children in subjection, how can you run the church? That's the qualifications. That's not me. I'm not chauvinistic. It's what the Bible says. It's the order. So shouldn't there be women pastors? Listen, I'm not God, so I can't ordain one. But if God ordained one, I've got to recognise it. Sometimes a woman's the man for the job. Sometimes God can't find a man, so he chooses Deborah. But don't play at God. You do what God says, but don't get God to keep to those laws. God's God, so he'll pick somebody that would be disqualified for you. Pick a murderer and make him the great apostle. And choose a woman. Deborah. Did you understand? When you're picking, use the Bible. If God picks, say, God, I couldn't pick that, but you've done it. If the fruit's there, hands off. You must have done it, God. I can't do it. I couldn't ordain them, but I haven't. You'd ordained them, so okay, God. God delights in doing things to confuse us, to get us out of our ruts, doesn't he? Read the Bible. It's scary what God did. And so God's done it. All right. She was delivered, verse 25. And the first came out, all hairy. And they called his name Esau. Okay. His name wasn't Edom at that time, it was Esau. They came out red, uh, all hairy, and they called him Esau. Edom means red, doesn't it? But it, that was when he changed. His name's Esau. He was hairy all over, and they called him Esau. All right, he sold his birthright, didn't he? Genesis 25. Thirty. Esau said to Jacob, I presume you know the story, feed me, I pray, with the same red pottage. It was red, red soup, wasn't it? Don't know whether it was lentil or tomato, it doesn't matter. But it was red soup, okay. 
feed me with that same red pottage and fate, therefore was his name called Eden. When he sold his birthright, he'd be called Red. Red. Don't forget the woman rides the red scarlet beast. Follow the scarlet thread. Have you seen the Da Vinci Code? It's about the bloodline of the occult. It's the scarlet thread. It's false that Jesus had a baby through Mary Magdalene and the bloodline. They're still looking for it now. There's the counterfeit. And Eden became the enemy of God and the counterfeit. His name was Red. The Russian Revolution was the Red Revolution. It was a Jewish revolution. The counterfeit Jews, the Zionists. Verse 34, that Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and thus rose up and went, and Esau despised his birthright. And because of the red pottage, he was called Eden, which is red. And he became the enemy. You know he despised his brother in his heart. He said, when my dad's died, I'll kill him. Esau had murder in his heart. Ishmael never had murder in his heart for, for Isaac, did he? Genesis 27. Hatred to the extreme, and it stayed in that scene forever. Esau has always wanted to get his birthright back. He's always wanted to be the chosen seed, because he thought firstborn he should have it, but he despised it and lost it. And Esau's still trying to get back his birthright, that's what the Battle of the Zionists is about, to get their Messiah, Edom. It might not make sense what I'm saying, but let me bring you some more scriptures. Esau would not let Israel into the Promised Land. They've always tried to thwart the promises of God. He wouldn't even give his brother permission to come through to get in the promised land. They tried to stop it. Esau's always tried to stop the plan of God. Let's just read that. Uh, John, Numbers 20. Verse 24. I'll be flitting about, forgive me, just hold things in your head. Numbers 20. Is it verse 20 here? Yeah? And he said, Thou shalt not go through. The that Israel has asked permission, Can we go through your land to the promised land? And he said, You'll not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people and a strong hand. Esau not only said, You can't come through, he went to fight against his own brother, against Israel, Jacob. Jacob's changed to Israel, you know that. So he's fighting his own brother. This is the tribe of Israel against the tribe of Esau. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border. Wherefore Israel turned away. They stopped the plan of God. He couldn't get into the land. They resisted the plan of God. Esau stopped Israel getting in the promised land. Are you getting the message? Everything's prophetic. By having the counterfeit in Israel now, they're stopping the real plan, or they think. Uh, Genesis 27, 41. All right, that's the hatred. And Esau hated Jacob. Ishmael never hated Isaac. One's the flesh, one's the spirit. And Paul said in Galatians, there's an allegory, the flesh and the spirit fight which we know that's the allegory of the flesh and the spirit. We know that, don't we? But I'm not talking about the flesh and the spirit. I'm talking about two seeds, two battles in the womb, two nations. One, the counterfeit, one who lost the inheritance and ever since has been trying to get it back. Extreme hatred to murder. Wouldn't even let his brother pass through his land. All right. You can get great revelation by reading the story in the Old Testament and seeing what the epistles say about it. Elijah. What, well, if I say Elijah, what do you think about fire from heaven? You've missed the plot. There was a famine in the land. The last thing you want is fire in a famine. What do you need in a famine? Rain. It's about the rain, what be major on the fire. 
The fire was a prerequisite to burn up the dross to get the revival. Revival is not fire. The rain is the fire because rain brings harvest. Fire does no good on a harvest. If you want the great harvest, you don't want fire, do you, on a harvest? The symbolism's wrong. Oh Lord, send the fire. The fire's to burn up the false prophets in the church so we can get the rain to get the fruit and the revival. Think about it. And we're all saying, oh, these are the days of Elijah. That means he's going to burn up half the church. It's the wrong song, isn't it? Think about it. The days of Elijah are coming, but don't sing it if you don't know what it's going to be. It's to burn up the prophets of Baal so we can get the rain. The rain's what you want in revival. Romans 9. Now, Paul talks about Jacob and Esau, so this is interesting. Just like James gets to the salient, important parts, he doesn't tell the story. The New Testament tells you what the story was about. So we've got a lot of revelation by looking at the Old Testament and then seeing what the epistles got from it. And it's all about predestination. I'm not talking about the doctrine. I'm not preaching Calvinism or anything. So I'm not talking about the doctrine. I'm talking about God choosing. Okay. So don't, don't accuse me of, of bringing a doctrine into it. I'm just what God says. Where should I start? Verse 1. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. I have great heaviness in my heart for Israel. I wish I could be cursed. There's a Moses. Block me out of the book if you won't save Israel. Paul says, I wish I could be damned in the lake of fire. Cursed of God is damned, is it? He says, I wish I could go to the lake of fire. If it has saved my brethren, I've got such a heart for Israel. He knew he couldn't be. But he says, if I could, I'd be a saviour. I'd die for Israel. In fact, I'd go to the lake of fire for Israel. My, I don't know whether I could go to the lake of fire for my wife, who I love passionately. I think I could die in the flesh. If somebody says, I'll kill you or your wife, I'd have to play the man and say, shoot me, and save my wife and children, wouldn't I? I'm not much of a man if I won't take the bullet for my wife. I don't love her, do I? Husbands, treat your wives like Christ treated the church and gave his life for it. So a good husband will give his life. But if God says, Morris, only one of you can go to heaven, the other goes to the lake of fire, goodness, please don't ask me, God. That's not a question God had asked, but could I do it? Paul could. Moses said, block me out of the book if you won't say Israel. I'm not there, are you? I, I, I still put pretending. I don't think I can go to the lake of fire for anyone. I, I, I can't. God, please don't even make me think about it. It's too much. I'm not there. I don't love enough. I, I don't know whether I could sacrifice my son, see my son butchered to save anyone. You know, it's, it's, we're talking about real issues, aren't we? And I'm not where, I'd, I'd, where Paul was. But he goes on. Let me jump in, get on to... Not as though the word of God hath none effect, verse 6. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Because you're circumcised doesn't make you son of God. Neither because they are the seed of Abram. Because Ishmael was the seed of Abram. Many nations are of the seed of Abram. Many nations who are the enemy of God are the seed of Abram. He had many nations out of him. That is, they which are the children of the flesh are not the children. But the children of the promise, they're counted for the seed. So you're a child of promise by faith. You're counted as the children of Abram. Is that right? For the children, verse 11, not yet being born, now he's talking about Esau and Jacob. You'll see, the children not being born, neither having done good or evil, they're in Rachel's womb. They've neither done good or evil. That the purposes of God... According to election, that's God's choice, not man's. So the purposes of God, according to his choice, his dictate, and he's going to reverse the order, might stand. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. So he's talking about Esau and Jacob, isn't he? And the uh, election of God. As it is written, listen to this, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Because he sold his birthright, no, he's talking about in the womb. He's saying it's predetermined of God, is that what it's saying? 
The children not have it done good or evil, so the purpose and plan of God should be accomplished of election, not of works. He's eating the pottage and selling his birthright was his works, not of works, not because they've done it, God predetermined. Don't fit this to your theology. This is what God said. It's quite plain. Fit your theology to this and call it whatever flavour you want, but don't deny this. It was said to the elder, the younger shall, elder shall serve, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Gives us a problem, doesn't it? I thought God loved everyone equal. Well, you don't know God of the Bible. What shall we say? Is there unrighteousness with God? Why should God choose a vessel of honour and a vessel of dishonour? I can understand if he does bad and he's a naughty boy, you're a vessel of dishonour because you've dishonoured me. But when we talk about God predetermined, we don't like it, do we? You don't like that. So Paul knows our thought. He said, so is God unrighteous? It's good that Paul's arguments are wonderful because he stands in our shoes and says, well, is God, un God forbid? Because he said to Moses, I'll have mercy on who'll have, have mercy and who will have compassion on I'll have compassion on. And who will want to harden I'll harden. I'll harden Pharaoh's heart. He didn't say Pharaoh was a hard man. He said to Moses, you go and I'll harden his heart. So he won't let you go so I can smash him and show my power. For this reason I rose Pharaoh up so I can show my power. I hardened his heart to show how powerful I am. If I deliver you from a little Mickey Mouse society, but I'm going to deliver you from a, an iron furnace, Pharaoh, and I'm going to make him say no, 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 and I'll plague him. And then when I deliver it, you'll know. What power I've got. The power is best is shown by the opposition. I raise Pharaoh up for that purpose. And when you go to Bible school, they say Egypt's the world and Satan. It, Pharaoh is a type of Satan at Bible school. Is that what they say? Pharaoh is a type of Satan. That's what they say at Bible school. And it says, for this reason I've raised Pharaoh up. I've raised Satan up to smash him down and show my power. God's in complete control. So then... Listen to the arguments. It's not of him that willeth, I want to serve God, nor of him that runneth, but of God that shows mercy. I'm not preaching Calvinism. I'm not preaching predestination. That's a doctrine. I'm preaching what the Bible says. For the scripture said, for this reason I've raised Pharaoh up, therefore he has mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Well, you'll say to me, and we'll say to Paul, that's not fair. God's not like that. So you'll say to me, if God's chosen him to be bad, why does he find fault? Why does he send people to the lake of fire if they're predetermined? Why would he smash Pharaoh down when he hardened his heart? That's not fair. Because who's resisting God's will? Nay, old oh man, who are you to reply to God? Who are you to challenge God's character? That's what God's like. Why should we challenge it? Because we don't like it. It doesn't suit our worldview of God. Paul says, who are you to question God? That's what God did. What was the, what's your problem? Get to know the real God, not the God that you'd like. Paul says, that's the real God. Who are you to challenge God? Hath not the potter, listen to this, has not the potter the power over the same lump, one conception, the same lump, because the context is Esau and Jacob. Has he not power over the same lump to make one vessel of honour and another of dishonour? Out of the same lump. He made a vessel of honour, Esau of a hated, Jacob of a lump, out of the same conception. Not a different woman, a bad woman, and a same woman, same man, and God predetermined in the womb. What if God willing to show his wrath, to show his anger? How can God show his anger? Unless he gets angry and does some damage. You wouldn't know I'm angry unless I shout, would you? Throw me toys out the pram. Oh, I'm very, very angry, you know. I'm really, really, really angry. You'd say, yeah, yeah, with the corner up. You wouldn't believe me, would you? God can only show his anger by demonstration. And what if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction? And that he might make known the riches of his glory and his mercy that he's before prepared unto glory, even us who is called. 
So when you read about the lump of clay and, and a vessel of honour and dishonour from the same lump, it's in the context of Esau and Jacob. Is it not? Is it not the context? Okay. So are you seeing that God's decided they're going to be enemies in the womb? Two nations, two separate people. What the younger will serve, the, uh, the younger will be head and the eldest will serve. Put up Genesis 25, J8 and 9. Just to show you that Esau and Isaac were the enemies. When the father died and his son Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Matt Peeler in the field, all right. They didn't end up enemies, did they? Is that fair enough? They're brothers and they buried the father together. The enemies are Esau and Jacob, okay. And that's an eternal thing that's going to determine the last days. And the restoration of Israel is the destruction forever of Edom. There'll be no Edomites in the millennium, there'll be never any more. You'll be amazed when I bring the scriptures out, okay. This is just set in the... The peace. Did you know that before 1948, Arabs and Jews, Arabs from Ishmael, aren't they? The Arabs and the Jews lived peacefully in Palestine for hundreds of years. No problem. There was no Arab Jewish problem before 1948, did you know? They lived together happily. It's only when the Zionists took over that this problem started. Something funny there. Something very funny, because Jews and Arabs lived in Palestine for hundreds of years peacefully. But when the Zionists take over, trouble began to develop and it's all orchestrated. Think about it. Why do the Arabs, some of them, hate the Jews? Well, it's not difficult. Put up the scripture, Jay. Uh, Genesis 28. Esau had married two Hittite Canaanite women. Now Abram said to Isaac, do not marry outside, is that right? Choose from your own family. Isaac told Jacob, go to your father-in-law and get a wife there. Don't marry the heathen. Esau married Canaanite women. And when he saw that it didn't please his father, because it, yeah, see the daughters didn't please his father. He'd already married two Canaanite daughters, two, two Canaanite wives. All right, it, I, I forget the scripture now because I want to move on. So Isaac went unto Ishmael and married a daughter of Ishmael. And the hate from Esau went into Ishmael. And that's the seed of Esau in the Arabs that hate the Jews. The ordinary Arabs don't. They're in the desert crying out for water and we've got it. The Arabs have been rejected by the Father. Don't you get angry at Arabs. Get angry at terrorists, yeah. That's the spirit of Esau married into them. But Arabs, you should love them because they're the children of Abram and Abram rejected them. Abram sent him out to die, is that right? His own son, how would you feel if your father sent you out to die? He sent him away into the desert to die and God heard the lad crying. And God came and brought him water in the desert. The Arabs in the last days are crying out for truth. They're desperate for water. They've got the spirit of rejection. Fancy Christians who are all the Arabs, the enemies of God. They're not the children of Abram. And they're crying out for water and you've got it. Go and tell them Jesus loves them. Not that Allah is the Antichrist. Forget all that. Why don't you tell them Jesus? They're desperate for water. And if you give them water when they're thirsty, they'll love you. Jesus is appearing to Muslims in Muslim countries personally. God doesn't hate them. A friend of ours in Africa, where is it, Ghana? He was a Muslim. He was bankrolled by Arabia to Muslimize the, the, the Africans. And he was going around converting villages to, to Islam. And he was in the mosque at Ramadan praying to Allah. And Jesus appeared to him. And he screamed out. And the imam there said, what's happened? He said, I've seen a vision of Jesus. He said, wonderful. 
because Jesus is a great prophet to the Muslims. What did he say? He said, he said, I was the only way, follow me. The man said, that's Satan. Forget it. So he forgot it. Walked out of the mosque and couldn't forget it. And realised that that was the real Jesus. And started converting Muslims to Jesus. He went round the village, he says, As you know how I've converted you to Islam. He said, well, I'm going to take your stage further. <laughs> this is the next stage now, you need to turn to Jesus. And he converted them all. And they put a death threat on his life. They said, in ten days, if we know we've lost you. We've lost you. But if you preach to these villages and convert them to Jesus, we'll kill you. So he went for fast for the ten days. And on the tenth day, the chief man of the area dropped dead. And fear came upon them and they never touched him. So now he's building orphanages and preaching Jesus. A Muslim. I've got a book, you should read it. What is it called? Here cometh Ishmael, it's by an ex-Muslim. Showed you how God loves them so much and God's going to restore them in the last days, children of Abram. It's Esau that you should get mad at because he married into Ishmael and that's where the hates come from. A small minority, all right. Think about that, all right. Don't, don't follow the newspapers and what Christians say, okay. Christians don't know so much, do they? They've been indoctrinated, you see. Not many people can think for themselves, Christians are not, can they? They all want to be individual, I'm all I want to do my own thing, so I follow the crowd. Every young person wants to be different, so they follow the fashion. It's funny, isn't it? There's a desire for us to think outside the bodies to be different, but we're, we're desperate to conform. Because when you put your head up in a different, the coconut shy, they knock your head off. Best to stay in the crowd and you're safe. Whenever Israel backslid, or often when they backslid, God brought their enemies, didn't he? When Solomon backslid, who did he bring to afflict him? 1 Kings 11, 14. And the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. Whenever they backslid, God will stir up the enemy. Who's the enemy? Not Ishmael, Esau. Okay. Let me explain what I meant, and I hope I didn't drop a bombshell. Jesus is not king of the Jews. God wants to be king of Israel. That's his title. Of all the tribes, they've got to be united before his king. But you see, Israel rejected God as king and wanted a king of the flesh. And so they've got one. Zephaniah 3.15, have you got that, Jay? God calls himself the king of Israel, okay? Always Israel. God never calls himself king of the Jews. Jesus never called himself king of the Jews. I'll bring you some scriptures. He'll be the king of the whole 12 tribes when they're united. The term king of the Jews was used by the Pharisees and the people who wanted to kill him and the Romans. The wise men would have got Jesus killed. They said, where's the king of the Jews? Who did he go to? An Edomite, Herod. Herod was an Edomite from Idumea. They nearly got Jesus killed. And what did they say? They didn't say, where's the king of Israel? They says, where's the king of the Jews? That was the one they wanted. Herod was the king of the Jews. Matthew 27. When Jesus was asked, are you the king of the Jews? He never said yes. Go on, Johnny, next to scripture. And Jesus stood before the governor and he said, are you the kings of the Jews? He says, you said it. No, I am. Why didn't he say, yes, I am? So that's what you say. That's what they say of me. He never said yes. Superscription was written over him. This is the king of the Jews. Who put that over? Was it God? It was the Romans. Rome's the legs of Babylon. Babylon said he's the king of the Jews. Matthew 27. And when they planted a crown of thorns, they put it on their head and they bowed the knee and they mocked him, Hail, king of the Jews. They didn't say king of Israel. All right, I'm going to show you where it is saying the king of Israel. It's to those who had the revelation. Is there another one, Jay? Yeah? Oh, yeah. If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. All right. Those who had divine revelation, 
called Jesus King of Israel. John 1, 49. Nathaniel had revelation, is that right? What did Nathaniel say? Nathaniel answered him and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. That's a revelation. You're not a man. You're the son of God and you're the king of Israel. Why didn't he say you're king of the Jews? Why? Because Israel had been scattered. Listen, in Jesus' time, everyone knew where Israel were. James. Who did James write his letter to? The church in Jerusalem, the church in the elect lady's house like John, no. To the twelve tribes scattered abroad, greetings. James wrote to the twelve tribes. They knew where they were in Jesus' time. Scotland knew where they came from, so did Norway and Great Britain. But we've changed history to hide our heritage. All the kings of Israel, England, were circumcised, did you know that? Did you know years ago, nobody in Scotland ate pork? The traditions die hard, you know. It's changed now. Re read some history and find out. Funny subject with the kings of England circumcised, but find out. It's interesting, isn't it? You were the king of Israel. He had revelation. The people who had revelation took branches of palm trees, said, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel. Why didn't they call him king of the Jews? The Romans said this is the king of the Jews. They knew that the Jews weren't Israel. They knew Jews were from Judah or born in Judea. Sometimes a prophet said, go to Israel and prophesy. Go to Judah and prophesy. Two separate nations. Some were called to one, some the other. James sent his letter to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. He knew where they were. The early church went to the 12 tribes. Why do you think there's St. Andrews in Scotland? In those same documents, it says Andrew came to Scotland. That's why they're St. Andrews, patron saint of Scotland. They're not fables. Read your history. They went everywhere, going to all the world and preach the gospel. First Israel. Go not the way of the Gentiles. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus told them to go. And so they went all over the world where the tribes were. The gospel spread everywhere. Did you know that St. Thomas went to India? Because I go to India, so people said, have you seen where St. Thomas went? I said, what are you talking about? Thomas go to India? He said, yeah. There's been a Christian colony for 2,000 years since Thomas went to India. And you'll find all over the world the apostles went. Trace it. So I believe the Zionist Jews have taken over Palestine in the flesh and called it Israel. And they want their Messiah, the Edomite, Edomite, King of the Jews, to be in Israel. They don't want Jesus, the King of Israel, want the King of the Jews. And when Israel is finally restored, Esau will be annihilated, I believe. I'm going to bring the scriptures, so wait for that. And I think I showed in the migration of the Jews, 80% of modern Jews are actually Edom. Do you remember the quote from the Jewish Encyclopedia, modern Jewry is Edom. So they believe they're Edom, don't they? Isn't it? Do you not find this amazing that the Jewish Encyclopedia would say modern Jewry is Edom? 80%. And the, the old enemy has got always present. And we've read Revelation 2, 8 and 3, 9. You're the church that get no recrimination because you've seen those who are, say the Jews, but they're not. They're the synagogue of Satan. But we've covered that, haven't we? Edomites. All right, let, let's look at some scriptures, maybe. The prophets foretold the day when Israel would be avenged. Did you know the song of Deborah in Judges? Because she went to Megiddo to fight the battle. Read the song of Deborah. It's about the battle that she fought. It's also prophecy of Armageddon that's coming. Judges 5. Lord, when you went out of Seir, where's Seir? Edom. Uh, maybe you, you, don't, you, know, you don't know your history and that, but get your Bible out and look at Seir. It's Eden, Mount Seir, Edom. All right. You went out of sea. When you marched out of Edom, the earth trembled because you've just tread the wine press. We've just read it. Who is this that cometh from Bosra? That's in Edom. With your garments dyed in blood. Okay. 
I told you about the Khazars who came from, you know, the Jews came from, the, the modern Jews. In the Middle Ages, they were called Red Jews because they were Edom, red. Edom means red, doesn't it? They were Red Jews, Edom Jews. So they called them Red Jews. That's why the Rothschilds put the red star of the occult on their thing, the star of David is occult. The symbol of Israel is the menorah. That's what should be on the flag, not the occult. Go into witchcraft and look at the star of David. You'll find it predates Christianity, it predates Israel. Stephen in his defence says it, you worship the star of Molech, star of Rephaim. Go on your Google, the star of, uh, is it, not Rephaim, Reph Rephidim. Look in Google, the star of Rephidim, and there'll be loads of web occult websites telling you about the star of Rephidim. It's the star of David. And Stephen says in the Acts of the Apostles, in the wilderness you worship the star of your God, Rephidim. Find out what it is. God's people always go to the occult, don't they? The Red Revolution. It was revenge because the Jews, the Edomite Jews, who were expelled from Russia, did you know? They always get the revenge. Esau will always get his revenge. That's why they killed all the Tsars. That's why they slaughtered all the royalty. It was nothing to do with the peasants. Peasants can't do anything. They're just cannon fodder. They were financed and stored up. And they went and slew their royalty. It was revenge. And every nation, our own queen and king, and all the royalty of Europe, no, don't touch the Rothschilds. Don't touch the Edomites. Look what they did to Russia as a revenge. They always get the revenge. Kings know it. You don't play around with them. They might wait till the next hundred years, they will get the revenge. And the Red Revolution was the Edomite Jews who were expelled from Russia. So was the one of China. China's the, the, the sample for the one world system. They experiment with China, the Red Revolution. The things that go on in China are to see if they'll work with the tyrant, with the one world dictator. They're seeing if it'll work. You know when I talk about Jews, I'm talking about the false ones, not the tribe of Judah, God's people. So please, I keep saying that. Psalm 3137. Did you know David in Psalm 137 calls Edom a daughter of Babylon? That's interesting, isn't it? I'm just bringing scriptures and, you know, if you think, well, that doesn't prove anything and that does. You, I'm bringing lots of scriptures. You look. Remember, O oh Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem. Lord, when you've come to Jerusalem and sit on your throne and you uh, come to Israel, remember Edom. Don't forget he's our enemy, Lord. Raise it, raise it to the foundation, O oh daughter of Babylon. Happy shall he be, the last sentence, that shall take your children and dash them against the stone. There's a blessed person who takes the children of of Edom's children and smash the babies on a stone. David, you vindictive little king. Was he not speaking under the anointing of the Holy Ghost? Oh, we better write that psalm off. David had lost it. He'd had a bad day. Too much king's wine. I can't do that with the Bible. You've either got to believe it all or none, because if you say, well, that's a bad translation, and that's a good bit, and that's... The things I don't like, well, the translator's got it wrong, you see. When you come to Jerusalem, don't forget to avenge Edom. Blessed person who smashes Edom. He sort of, I hated. He's only got the spirit of God. God said, I hate Edom. So if David get, jumps on the bandwagon, don't blame him. It's funny that the woman sits on a scarlet beast. Does that make sense? Why not a blue one, a red one, a green one? There's lots of colours God could have picked. A golden coloured, a pale coloured horse. A dapple-coloured horse, a red horse. Colours mean something. This is the thread, the Edomite thread, red, red, red. When it says red in the Bible, make sure you've read it correctly. I've done a dangerous thing. I brought some books that are not on the table, all right. <laughs> Have you ever read the Protocols of the Elders of Zion? Have you heard about it? Well, it's when, though, go to Google and the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and the Zionists say it's a forgery. 
It's, it's anti-Semitic. Well, it's anti-Zionist for sure, but it, you know, claiming the Zionists, the protocols of the elders of Zion. And it's showing how they're going to take over the world. And so they've said it's a forgery. We've proved it's a forgery. Well, it doesn't really matter. It was written many years ago. This, this was translated from the Russian, OK. It was written before that, but it doesn't matter whether it's a forgery or not to the point that what's said in that book is happening now. It was written a hundred years ago. And everything that the, it said the elders would do, it's happening. It's not nice reading. They're very, very ruthless. Everyone who's not a Zionist Jew is scum. Scum. You're just meant to be used and abused. And it's not nice reading, but what it says, you can see a hand. So does it matter if it was a forgery or not in one way? It, to me, it proves it's not, because everything they said is happening. So I've got some. You can have them just for a fiver, just to cover the printing, all right. And you can read it and burn it, or you can pass it on, or, or do whatever you want, all right. Give it me back, I'll give you your fiver back if you want, I don't mind. I don't, I don't sell books for money, it's to, to feed people if it doesn't feed you. Regurgitate it, it's finger marked and tatty, doesn't matter, does it, Helen, you get another one. <laughs> Helen said, oh, that played a man, I've, I've given it so many people, it's so dog-eared and that. So I said, well, you deserve another one, try and look after that a bit better. It's about feeding, God looks after the money, doesn't it, when you're in the ministry. Feed people. Jesus fed them with five loaves and two fishes, five thousand, so... You know, if you cast your bread on the waters, God will look after me, and if he doesn't, it doesn't matter, does it? I don't mind if I die of starvation. Or like Dave Wilkinson, I pass away in my car and a truck hits me, but I'm in heaven already. It, it doesn't matter, does it? God doesn't pity the flesh. He's, it's me God's worried about. All right, so they're there. I don't think they'll all go, but if they do, I've got a few more at home. All right, I'll print some more. Jesus knew. I've got a long list of scriptures that I'll just let Joni flash up all about Edom in a minute. But uh, Jesus knew who they were, you know. Uh, well, I've got Isaiah 14, 11, 12. Have you shown them that, Jane? This is about the rest restoration of Israel. He shall set up an enzyme for the nations, assemble the outcast of Israel. So the context is the restoration, okay. You need to know the context, that's good teaching. They shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines, etc. Highlighted, they shall lay their hands upon Edom. Whenever it talks about the restoration of Israel, Edom's punished. Jesus knew, John 8, verse 33, they answered him, we be Abram's seed. Well, Edom were Abram's seed. Because Esau is Abram's seed, isn't he? Came through Isaac. So he's Abram's seed. We be Abram's seed. And we were never in bondage to any man. How do you see? How do you say you'll set us free? Jesus said to them, Verily I say unto you, Who commits sin is a servant of sin, and he goes on. If the son of Abram, God shall make you free, you'll be free indeed. I know you're Edom, I know you're Abram's seed. Because you're Edomites. But you seek to kill me. Why would you seek to kill Jesus, King of Israel? Because my word has no place in you. I speak which I've seen of my father, and you do what seen of your father. They said, Abram's our father. He said, if you're Abram's children, you do the works of Abram. But now you seek to kill me, a man who told you the truth. Abraham didn't do that. You do the deeds of your father. They said we're not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. They were Abram's children after the flesh, but after the spirit, they were Satan's children. Jesus said, if God were your father, he said, I know you're Abram's children, but there's something wrong, you're seeking to kill me. He said, if God were your father, once they mentioned God, he says, hold on, on, it, on, on a minute, I'll accept your Abram's children, because you can be of the flesh of Abram. 
But if God were your father, you'd love me, provide proceeded from God. Why do you not understand me? You and of your father, the devil. Talking to Jews. And the lusts of your father, these are Pharisees. The people who upheld the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud. And the lusts of your father you'll do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And the truth was not in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. If your father's the devil, you attend the synagogue of Satan, surely. When he said that, they picked up stones to kill him, it said the next verse. As soon as he challenged them, he said, yes, of the flesh you're the seed of Abram, but of the spirit, I hate you. Your father's the devil. He's trying to kill me. All right, let's look at the scriptures. The time's going, so let's just look at them. Right, Jeremiah 49. The, please believe me, but check me out. I've checked them. They're all in the context of the restoration of Israel. The end days, okay. Jeremiah, Edom shall be a desolation. Jeremiah 49, 20. Therefore, hear the counsel of the Lord that is taken against Edom. His purposes, his purpose against the inhabitants of Teman. He shall make their habitation desolate. Jeremiah 49. Behold, he shall come as an eagle and spread his wing over Bosra, that's in Edom. And that, that day, that day, that's the day of the Lord when he comes, the heart of the mighty men of Edom shall be as the heart of a woman in a pang, so no destruction's coming. Ezekiel 25. These are all the prophets talking about the restoration and now the destruction. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, because Edom has dealt against the house of Jude, to be taking vengeance, etc., I will also stretch my hand upon Edom, I'll cut off man and beast from it, and I'll make it desolate. That wasn't then, that's when Israel's restored. Read the context, okay? Lamentations, is it next? I've picked lots of different books. The punishment of your iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion, that's Israel. Your iniquity is finished, I'm going to restore you. You'll be saved in a day, on the day of atonement, I'll wipe the slate clean, and then he will visit your iniquity, O daughter of Edom, he'll discover your sins. Ezekiel 25. Thus saith the Lord, oh sorry, I'll lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel. And they shall do in Edom according to my anger, according to my fury. Vengeance on Edom. Joel. Notice these are all prophets. They all talk about the last days. Ministers weep between the porch and the altar. They all talk about the restoration of Israel, the destruction of Edom. Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah because they've shed innocent blood in their hands. The Dionysus collaborated with Hitler. They were happy for Jews to be killed because it got them Palestine. They were willing to sacrifice. Read uh, Theodore Herzl's letters in his diary. They're, they're available now. He said, it's good if more Jews get killed. It'll help our cause. That's not a man who loves his own people, is it? <laughs> but you read it, it's in the archives. It's good now, because we've got the internet, you can check up official records, can't you? As well as nonsense. Don't believe everything on the internet, will you? But, you know, check, make sure they're official, make sure it's the, the Jewish encyclopedia and not some hothead. Obadiah, 1-1. One, one. The vision of Obadiah. Did you know the whole book of our Obadiah is a prophecy against Edom? Did you know? That's all that Obadiah talks about. The whole book's about the destruction of Edom. I've just taken one verse. The first one, you read the whole chapter, there's your homework. The vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord God, concerning Edom, and the whole chapter's about it. Arise you and let us rise up in battle against her. The last days. Jeremiah 49.10 But I have made Esau bear, I have uncovered his secret places, and he is not. He won't exist, I'm going to destroy him, he's my enemy. If I restore Israel, I'll destroy, restore Israel, I'll destroy Edom. Ezekiel, the whole of chapter 25, 35 of Ezekiel, is all about the destruction of Edom. 
I'm, I'm using a lot of scriptures, aren't I? And I've not picked them up. As you did rejoice at the inheritance of the house of Israel because it was desolate, so I will do to you. You shall be desert, O Mount Seir, and all Edomir, that's Edom. Everyone will know I've done it. Everyone will know God's hate for Esau. What else have we got, Johnny? There is Edom with kings and princes, slain by the sword. Does that ring a bell, that terminology? Isn't that the same vein of rhetoric that he uses against Lucifer? You'll go down to the pit, you'll lie with the uncircumcised, I'll expose you. Isn't it funny? I'll make you bare, slain by the sword. You'll die with the uncircumcised, with those that go down to the pit. Tomorrow when I explode the myth of Lucifer, that's what he says about Lucifer, same things. I don't like just putting the verses up. You'll have to believe me and check me out that it's about what I'm saying, the restoration of Israel in the context. Have you any more, Johnny? Malachi. So I've been through most of the prophets now, haven't I? I started with David in the Psalms, and I've got Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jeremiah. I mean, how many more do we want? And here's Malachi, the last one. I'll build up, I'll do this. God says, and I'll throw you down. The people against whom the Lord has indignation forever. Jacob have I loved. Israel will I restore. Israel are the apple of my eye. Esau I hate. Predetermined. And when Paul's talking about the plan of God and God's choice, he uses Esau and Jacob. Read Romans again. I'm not just picking anything out. That's God's illustration of whom I want, I'll harden, and whom I want, I'll bless. And I'll have mercy on him, and he's a vessel for destruction. And Esau and Jacob are the illustration. Jacob have a loved, Esau have a hated. So, out of the same lump. Not because one's good and one's bad. He was called Esau. Then he was called Edom, red. But God had predetermined it. <laughs> When Jesus comes a second time to earth, it's to judge and avenge. And he's going to start with Edom, because he's going to restore Israel. He'll come suddenly to his temple and purge it, Malachi. He before we look for, will come suddenly. I didn't put the scripture, I don't know why, but it's Malachi. The first thing he'll do is turn the money changers out of Jerusalem. He'll get rid of the Zionists. Because for Zionists you can write Rothschilds. I've got books, The History of the Rothschilds, if you want to read it. Just a timeline of the Rothschilds. 1948, this happened. It's just, there's no political bias, there's no Christian thing. It's just telling the history from when they started, how they've taken over. And how much they own. And the money changes are in the temple again. The zeal of God will do it. Here's the scripture that I keep quoting, I, I thought I'd it. Isaiah 63, 1-6. Who is this that comes from Edom? Who's coming from Edom? With his garments from Bosra, Edom. Glorious in his apparel. Why are you red in your apparel? And your garments like the treads in the wine. Why is God all red? Because he's tread the grapes of Edom and he's got the red all over him. He's tread the wine press of Edom. Who's this? His garments are dyed with the blood of Edom. That's the context. Jesus is covered with the blood of Edom. He's come from Bosra. For it is a day of vengeance in my heart, and the year of the redeemed is come. Esau and Israel go together. One's redeemed, one's punished. There was none to help me. My own zeal has brought salvation. Israel couldn't redeem themselves. They're a stiff-necked people. My own zeal has done it. My own zeal has redeemed Israel and destroyed their enemies. It's all about God. I will tread down the people in my anger, make them drunk in my fury, and bring down my strength to the earth. That's why I've left it to the end, because I think I'm leaving with you with that. Esau found no place of repentance, even though he sought it carefully with tears. Esau couldn't repent. It was determined. It says that. It's Paul's warning. Where is it, the warning of... Oh, well, it's in Hebrews. Okay. Hebrews 12. I'm finishing with this. 
as they say, and here I rest my case. You're the jury, go out and decide. This is our challenge. I always like to end on a practice. What do we do about it? Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and you're defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know, well we didn't know. The Old Testament didn't tell you, did it? You need the New Testament to give you a revelation on the Old. If you don't know the Old, you won't understand what the revelation's about. You wouldn't understand that unless you knew the Old. For you know, well we do now Paul, thanks. For you know that afterwards, after he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Why wouldn't God forgive him when he sought repentance? I thought if you repent, God will forgive you. It said, be careful and let Esau be an example and a fear to you. Let it be a deterrent. Don't fail from the grace of God. Because Esau found no place for repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears and cried. And God said, I'm sorry. It's predetermined. I decided in the womb. Not because he'd done good or bad. Because when God chose in the womb, he said that neither done good nor bad. I am not preaching Calvinism. I'm, I'm not preaching the doctrine about predestination or right. None of your business what I believe. I haven't got any doctrines. I believe the Bible. So this is what the Bible says. God predetermined that. Don't make a doctrine out of it. We make doctrines out of things, don't we? Why do we make a doctrine out of it? If God said that, it's true. If God says you've got a free will, I've got a free will. Why do we make doctrines to fight each other? We've entered politics, haven't we? I'm on the right, you're on the left. Let's shoot each other. No, let's love each other. And coin's got two sides. Me and my wife make one. But, but we're different. So take the rejection of Esau seriously as a warning against complacency in the last days. That's how I wanted to end. All right. We need a challenge, don't we? Don't want you just say, well, that was interesting what Morris said. Might be true, might be not. If you forget everything I've said, the admonition of Paul, don't fall from grace and lose your birthright. Your inheritance, what's your inheritance? To reign with Christ. You've been chosen to reign with Christ. So don't lose your inheritance because you may not get it back. You may not lose your salvation, but you may lose the kingdom. Don't fall from grace. It's a challenge, isn't it? So Lord, please help us. Lord, we've got through the day, Lord, and we've had the teaching. Lord, I've had good fellowship with my, brother, my brothers and sisters. And I pray you'll give us a good night's sleep, Lord, and I pray that we... Things that we're disturbed about are not sure, Lord. Please let us put them on the back burner and not fret about them. Lord, your yoke is easy, your burden is light. and We're all at a different stage on the journey, Lord. And The idea isn't to push everyone up to our level or down to our level. We don't know where we are, Lord. We're just where we are, I'm me. So please don't let us judge one another, Lord, because we're not where we are or where we think we should be. Lord, let us leave people to find the truth. Let us have a good sleep, Lord, and rest, and, and let the nutritions and the vitamins feed us over the coming weeks and months. Thank you again, Lord, for being with us. Bless us abundantly. Bless our families at home, Lord, our friends, and keep our houses safe from the, the baddies, Lord, as I pray to the kids. Lord, we do love you. We want to serve you. Please help us. Lord, I don't want to fall from grace. I don't have to want after being a preacher to be a castaway. Help us, Father. We ask it in your name. Amen.